Well, thank you so much, everyone, for having me and uh, giving me this opportunity to open up God's Word. Just uh, always a great joy to uh, sing with you, to uh, worship our uh, great God together, uh, especially, you know, since I have a lot of history here, being a student at this school and growing up at this church, and I know that many of you had a hand in helping to raise me, and for that, uh, I'm eternally grateful, and my parents are as well. Uh, well, like Rebecca mentioned, uh, Hillside Church is sending me and a, a core team to plant a church. Uh, we're aiming for Sunnyvale or Santa Clara area, and just want to take a moment to share a little bit about that uh, with all of you this morning. Uh, essentially, we, we did a lot of research on the area and uh, looked at oh, hey. <laughs> uh, the entire Bay Area, and uh, really Santa Clara and Sunnyvale were the two areas where we found there were not that many churches, not that many uh, Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, Christ-exalting churches. Uh, certainly, there, there are not many Christians in this area. Uh, the, the recent statistics show that only about 5 to 10 percent of the people in those two cities of Santa Clara and Sunnyvale profess to be evangelical Christians. And so if you think about it, uh, at best, if you came across 10 people on the street, only one of them would even say that they're a Christian. And so the need for the gospel is certainly very great in this area. And I think you know the area. It's, it's you know very close to Silicon Valley. Uh, people work in Mountain View and, and that area, and then they live closer to Santa Clara, Sunnyvale area. And so you, you find a lot of people that are very affluent. You know, they have great jobs. They have, a, a, you know, a good paycheck and financial stability. And uh, with that, uh, there's this apathy, right? There's this, need, there, there's this feeling of, well, I don't need Jesus because I have a very comfortable life. And so we identified this area as a place that definitely needs the gospel, definitely needs to hear uh, about the saving work of Jesus Christ, and, and a place that's just desperate for uh, this salvation in Christ. Uh, so uh, we're, we're being sent off in September. The plan is September 18th will be the launch date. And uh, we have a core team of about 52 people that I'm actually going to meet with tonight and do a little bit of training on what exactly is church planning with them. They're a great group of people, uh, very excited, very eager to proclaim the gospel, to plant this church. And uh, so please do, do keep us in your prayers. Uh, if you would like some more information, if you want to know more specifically how you can pray for us, then you can pick up one of these booklets that I brought with me right over there. And uh, yeah, I mean, you can pray for uh, just the, the heart of the, the core team that we will have this a vision of Jesus that compels us to share him with other people. Uh, you can pray for our unity as a team that will be strong, that we truly will live out what it means to be the family of God. And so that anyone who joins will see the love that Christ has shown us. Uh, so thank you for, for keeping us in your prayers and for giving me a chance to share about the church plant. Uh, for today, you can turn to Genesis chapter 4. We're going to be very near the beginning of the Bible, very near the beginning of time itself. And we're going to hear the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, here in Genesis chapter 4, we meet the first family, and we find that it is a dysfunctional one. Sin has entered the world with Adam and Eve uh, eating of the tree that they were not supposed to, that God had commanded them not to. And because sin has now entered the world and spread, it has spread to their children as well. So even in this first family, we see sin. Uh, we see anger, hatred, murder, complaining, and lying. And as we see this story, we're going to see a God who stands in contrast to all of this sin. We're going to see a holy God and a God that is so set apart, so different from us, that he actually shows compassion to the sinner. And so we're going to see today a God of second chances, a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God who should completely shun this sinner, Cain, that should strike him down with a lightning bolt, but instead gives him a second chance, and in fact, a third chance, a fourth chance. And as we see this story of, of God who gives mercy and grace, we're also going to 
see some lessons about sin and repentance, how we too are just like Cain, we're sinners, but how we too have second chances with God, second chances to repent, turn from our sin, and turn to him in faith. So let's begin reading Genesis chapter 4, and we're first going to simply meet two brothers in verses 1 to 2. Let's read those. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. We see that because of Adam and Eve's sin, they have been banished from the Garden of Eden. Uh, they are now outside of the land, the perfect land that God had planned for them. And Eve bears two sons. One is named Cain and one is named Abel. And in the very beginning, we see that these two brothers are already set in contrast to each other. In verse 2, it says that Abel was a keeper of the sheep. He is a, he is a shepherd. But in contrast, Cain is a worker of the ground. He's more of a farmer. He's more of a gardener. Uh, he uh, makes his living through uh, fruits and vegetables. So we have this contrast between two brothers. And then in chapter or uh, verses three to five, we get more of the drama that plays out because these two brothers have some conflict. Verses three to five, let's read those. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Two brothers with contrasting occupations, now two offerings that also contrast with each other. Abel brings a sheep, uh, he brings a blood sacrifice, and Cain, on the other hand, brings an offering of fruits and vegetables, uh, that offering from the ground. And we see that God accepts one offering and rejects the other. Uh, he accepts Abel's offering of a flock. And the reason for this, we can look back in chapter 3, verse 21. Uh, we can read what God did for Adam and Eve. Chapter 3, verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Now, if you recall, Adam and Eve actually made clothes for themselves. They sewed together fig leaves. And fig leaves made fine clothing. Uh, they were able to cover them just fine. But even though they already had clothes, God said that that's not enough. Let me make you some clothes to cover your nakedness, to cover your shame. And he doesn't take some leaves. He doesn't take some other material. Instead, he kills an animal in order to take its skin, and he makes clothing out of the skin. Well, what God is doing there is he is demonstrating that a sacrifice, death, blood, is necessary to cover sin, uh, to atone for sin. And this is the kind of sacrifice that God requires. This is a lesson that he taught Adam and Eve, and this is a lesson that they would have passed down to their sons, that only through death could sin be atoned for only through a, a, a living sacrifice killed could sin be covered up. And this, of course, was to point forward to the ultimate sacrifice, uh, the ultimate substitute, and that is Jesus Christ, who would die and be sacrificed on the ultimate altar, the cross of Calvary. And so Cain and Abel would have known clearly that the sacrifice that God required was a blood sacrifice. Uh, also, if you were to turn to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11, uh, which is commonly called the hall of faith, all of these uh, believers in God lived by faith, you would see that Abel by faith offered a better sacrifice than Cain. 
And so it was simply his heart of faith. He, he heard what God said about the blood sacrifice, and he believed it. He trusted what God said, and that played out in his obedience. Cain, on the other hand, did not have this heart of faith. He didn't believe, didn't trust what God had said about the sacrifice. And so he said, well, I'm just going to make my own sacrifice. I'm a farmer, and so uh, I'm going to get some, some fruits and vegetables, and I'm going to offer this sacrifice. And so his offering was not made out of faith. And because Abel's sacrifice was, was made out of faith, believing what God said, and obeying him, his offering is accepted. Well, Cain doesn't like this. Uh, Cain is very upset. At the end of verse 5, it says, he was very angry and his face fell. Well, God notices that uh, just one of four people on earth is very disgruntled, uh, very mad. He sees his face is falling. And so God approaches him in verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. So the Lord personally comes to Cain and says, why are you so mad? Why is your face so distorted in anger? If you do well, will you not be accepted, verse 7 says. And so what God is saying is, Cain, you still got a chance here. Just do well. Offer the correct kind of sacrifice, the sacrifice that I require, and it'll go well with you. Essentially, what God is saying to Cain is repent. Do this U-turn in your life. Turn from following sin and follow me, this 180, this about face, this complete change of mind, change of heart, and as a result, walking in the opposite direction. This is what you should do, Cain. It's not over for you. You have a chance to repent here. And so notice that here is Cain's second chance. He messed up. He sinned. He gave the wrong sacrifice. But instead of God completely banishing him, away from his family, instead of punishing him, instead of sending him directly to hell, he comes to him in love and tells him, you can do what's right. You can turn things around here, offer the right kind of sacrifice, and I will accept it. But he also gives a warning. Verse 7, if you do not do well, then sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. And here God gives a word picture. Sin is illustrated by this wild animal that is crouching at Cain's door. So Cain, if you don't repent, not only are you not going to do well, but also you're going to spiral down into greater sin. Because guess what? Sin is crouching at the door waiting for you. And its desire is for you, that we're at the end of verse 7, for desire is a strong word. It means to, to dominate, to completely enslave. And so sin is not just going to entice you, not just going to tempt you, but sin is actually going to seek to dominate your life. Now, imagine if you woke up this morning, you know, brush your teeth, had a little breakfast, got changed, and... You had a little surprise waiting at your doorstep. You're just planning on going into your car, but instead there is a mountain lion waiting for you at the door. That would not be good for you, right? That is not a good situation, but even worse than a mountain lion waiting for you at the door is a mountain lion that's crouched down because you know he's about to pounce on you. And that is the word picture that God gives for sin. It is, it is this wild animal that's ready to attack. So you have to be very careful here. You have to be very careful because sin is about to pounce and dominate your life. Really the principle given here is that when you sin, if you do not repent right away, it'll be harder to repent later on. 
subsequent temptation is harder to resist. Temptation that comes later is going to be harder to resist. Sin is going to dominate your life. Uh, back in World War II, a very effective strategy that both the Allies and the Axis powers used was to bomb the enemy territory strategically by bombing parked aircraft, right? Much easier to bomb the aircraft while it's on the ground than in the air when it can defend itself. And so uh, this was a very effective way that both sides were able to cripple the military strength of the other side. You bomb the plane while it's still on the ground before it has a chance to fire back. Well, that's the principle here. Repent from sin. Fight sin early on before it becomes a crouching mountain lion that's going to attack you. And so uh, sin is so dangerous. As soon as you sin, sit down, take some time and repent. Confess that sin to God. Ask for forgiveness. Because if you don't do it right then and there, it's only going to get harder later on. Well, Cain does not take this second chance. He doesn't say, God, you're completely right, and I have been wrong. Let me, let me ask Abel for a sheep that I can use to offer you the correct sacrifice. Instead, this is what happens. Verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Very far from repentance, Cain shows a hard heart. Uh, his, he, he doesn't repent from his sin right away. And so we see that the temptation grows and his sin escalates extremely greatly. Uh, so he rises up and actually kills his brother. And then God, again, instead of punishing him on the spot, gives him yet another chance, gives him a third chance, gives him a chance to confess, says, hey, 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 Cain, haven't seen Abel around in a while. Where, where is he? And that's Cain's chance. Confess. Tell him what you did. But instead, this hard heart, this stubbornness. Oh, am I my brother's babysitter? Am I supposed to keep track of him all the time? And God then swoops in because he knows. Verse 10. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. So the Lord knows what Cain has done. Very graphic language in verse 10. The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Interestingly, Abel has actually never spoken in this story. But here, his blood speaks. Obviously not literally, but the spilt blood on the ground testifies, is a witness to what Cain has done to his sin. And God says, I know what you've done by the testimony of the blood on the ground. And so here is your punishment. You are cursed from the ground, which received your brother's blood. And then verse 12, specifically, when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. Now that's interesting, right? First of all, this is absolutely devastating to Cain because he's a farmer. He, he, he grows crops, uh, but God says now the ground is cursed. So it's gonna be really, really hard for you to get any kind of crops from the ground. If you remember all the way back to Genesis 3, that was the same curse that God had given Adam because Adam too was to uh, cultivate the ground and keep it and to, to make a living and to eat the fruits and vegetables from the ground. But now thorns and thistles 
are going to grow from the ground. It's going to be very hard. By the sweat of your brow, are you going to eat of the fruit of the ground? So the ground is already cursed. And now it's cursed further. So Cain, you're going to have an extremely difficult time with your job. Not only that, uh, verse 12, you're going to be a fugitive and wanderer on the earth. And so you're not going to be able to stay in this land with your family. You're going to have to wander the earth for the rest of your life. And then Cain said to the Lord in verse 13, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. You guys see the irony there? I'm going to wander the earth, and then someone's going to kill me. We can't have that. Someone's going to kill me. The irony that the murderer is now scared of getting murdered. Uh, he's got a double standard here. He thinks it's okay to murder his brother, but it's not okay for anyone to murder me. And so he complains. He cries out, uh, this punishment's just too great. Uh, I can't bear this. And what would you expect to see in verse 15? What would you expect God to say? Uh, I've given you chance after chance after chance to repent. So this is your just punishment. But instead, this is what God says. Verse 15, then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. God again shows mercy. He gives grace in that he says, okay, I'm going to protect you so that no one murders you. And Cain deserves to be murdered because he murdered. But God says, I'm going I'm to put a mark on you. We don't know what this mark was exactly. It's some kind of outward mark on his body that people could plainly see. And they would know, oh, don't mess with Cain. Don't mess with Cain. Because if you mess with Cain, God is going to mess with you. A sevenfold punishment on you. And so this was, was a deterrent. This would prevent people from, from murdering Cain even though they knew that he deserved it. And so God here shows grace. Uh, God uh, gives him yet another chance to repent. What should Cain's reaction have been here? Appreciation? Thankfulness? God, thank you so much. I know I deserve death, but instead you, you've given me a chance to continue living, and I've just been so foolish. You've been a good God this whole time, and I, I should follow you. So here is Cain's fourth chance to repent. Uh, but instead, there's no indication of that. Verse 16, then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So what do we learn from the story? Uh, well, as we've said, we've learned that Repentance only gets harder the more you let your sin fester. Temptation later on becomes harder to resist. And so cultivate a soft heart before the Lord. Be quick to repent. Quick to confess your sin. Be sensitive to your sin. And sometimes we just... Uh, you know, want to go on throughout our day, I'll repent of that later. Uh, but take the time, uh, just find a little alone time, uh, sit down and truly acknowledge how heinous, how ugly your sin is to God, ask for his forgiveness, and thereby cultivate this soft heart before him. Uh, otherwise, sin is crouching at your door, and it's waiting to destroy you and to dominate you. But secondly, and, and more importantly, we see a lesson about God's grace, uh, because really the main character in this story uh, is not Abel. Uh, he never speaks, and he's murdered halfway through. It's not even Cain, who's the bad guy, the 
antagonist in this story, but the main character is the only hero in this story, and it is God himself. God is the hero because he shows a compassion that is far beyond what we can imagine. Cain is just this wicked, wicked guy. You would not want to be friends with Cain. But God shows a heart of love toward him, chance after chance. Cain, would you repent? Would you come to me? Would you do what's right? Would you offer the right sacrifice? And would you confess your sin of murdering your brother? Would you live in communion with me? And, and friends, this is the God that we serve even today, the God of second chances, uh, the God of great compassion. Uh, Romans chapter 2 says that his kindness leads us to repentance. And so this is the God that calls out to us today, uh, telling us that it's, it's not too late. Until you breathe your last breath, it's not too late to turn from your sinful ways and embrace God through his son, Jesus Christ, uh, because his son is that ultimate sacrifice, the one who paid for sins once and for all, who died the death that we deserved on Mount Calvary. And because of that death, all those who place their faith in him, all those who turn from their sin and follow Jesus Christ in faith will be completely forgiven, will have all of their sins washed away. So if you're not a Christian here today, uh, this text, the word of God is calling out to you and giving you, I don't know what number chance, your 1000th chance to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And if you call out to him, in faith, uh, he will surely save you even this day. Uh, allow me to close in a word of prayer for all of us today. Uh, Father, we are so thankful that uh, we can call you Father and that we approach you knowing that you show grace, knowing that you are a God of great compassion. And Lord, I pray that your kindness will lead us all to repentance, that we will know that when we come to you in repentance, confess our sin, we will be forgiven, uh, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness, to cleanse us from all sin. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us this soft heart that would be sensitive to sin, to know that when we have broken your laws and God, that we would not allow that sin to remain in our heart and to harden it, but that we would acknowledge it to you and find mercy and forgiveness uh, multiple times a day so that we can live a life that is pleasing to you and a life that is in close fellowship and communion with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.